Did I already say good morning? Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting old. Brother Sharman's getting old quicker, though. I think he's the one that spoke up, right? <laughs> About 105 years ago, on the evening of April 14, 1912, this massive structure that you see on the screen, known as the Titanic, sunk to the bottom of the ocean. About 1,500 souls lost their lives that evening because they had chosen to get on a ship that was headed to disaster. They didn't know. It was an amazing structure, an amazing ship. It was a ship that many anticipated to be the best the greatest, the most amazing luxury liner ever constructed of its time and to have and to, to ever be constructed in the lifetime of these people in the gilded era of the 1900s. People that could afford it had signed up for a long time to get on this luxury liner. Folks that couldn't afford it just wished that they could be on it. First class tickets were expensive in those days. And second class tickets were expensive as well. But this was something amazing to see impressive to be in and I wish that I could have seen it in person but now I wish I would never go into it or much less sell in it I want to share with you this morning some things about the Titanic and make some spiritual connections and applications about this great luxury liner The newspaper of that time, on the 16th of April, 1912, news was slow to get out. And they weren't sure about the number of people that had died. I think that today there's some uh, uh, facts that don't even coincide with each other. Some say that 1,503 people died. Others say that 1,560 people died. They still don't even know exactly how many people died. But at least we have a newspaper from April 16th, 1912, saying that 1,500 to 1,800 dead. And the headline for this newspaper says that J.J. Astor lost on Titanic. It was among the passengers who went down with the ship according to a wireless dispatch received by Bass Streets last night from the Liner Olympic. And I've titled the lesson, Get Out what you, While You Can, While You Have an Opportunity. Francis Brown, an interesting story about Francis Brown was born in 1800, 1880 to be exact. He was studying for the Catholic ministry. He boarded the Titanic on the 10th of April. And he wanted to go on to Queensland. And he was gifted first class tickets by his uncle. And while he was on the trip, he, he was a photographer. He loved to take pictures. And while he was on the ship, he, was, he befriended a, a very uh, wealthy couple. And they gave him tickets to go on to New York. And he was excited. He, as you can imagine, a, a young uh, uh, 
a, a young theologian studying to be a Catholic priest who didn't have much money, only had first class ticket to make a short trip, but then receives another gift to make it all the way to New York. New York, New York. So he has to get permission from his superior to see if he can go all the way to New York. And he called or he wired, however he communicated to his superior. And his superior said, by no means. And the exact words were, get off that ship. And as luck would have it, he got off that ship just in time. And he was not one of those that died when the ship went down. And we have a 17-year-old teenager by the name of John Jack Thayer III. He and his family boarded the Titanic. He was an heir to his father's Pennsylvania Railroad fortune. Jack was one of the few people who lived to tell about the Titanic. He survived. When the Titanic went down, he was able to swim away from the Titanic, latch on to an upturned lifeboat. And until two years ago, a journal was released, a journal entry was released of what he wrote. He wrote the day that he was, to, that he made it to shore, he wrote a journal entry in memory and in honor of his father who died in the Titanic. And he says, I never saw long again. His body was later recovered. I am afraid that the few seconds elapsing between our going meant the difference between being sucked into the deck below. As I believe he was, or pushed out by the backwash, I was pushed out and then sucked down. The cold was terrific. The shock of the water took the breath out of my lungs. Down and down I went, spinning in all directions, swimming as hard as I could in the direction which I thought to be away from the ship. I finally came up with my lungs bursting, but not having taken any water. The ship was in front of me, 40 yards away. How long I had been swimming underwater, I do not know. Perhaps a minute or less. After latching to a lifeboat, I watched as the ship's passengers battled against the inevitable. We could see groups of the almost 1,500 passengers still aboard, clinging in clusters of bunches like swarming bees, only to fall in masses, pairs or singling, as a great after part of the ship, 200 feet of it, rose into the sinking sky, tilted it reached a 65 or 70 degree angle. He never enjoyed his father's fortune. So I believe that about a month or two later, he committed suicide. Then another one that I'll share with you before I move on in the lesson. Benjamin Guggenheim was a successful businessman. He had boarded the Titanic with his secretary and his mistress. And he had slept through the collision when the Titanic collided into the iceberg and was awakened by one of his servants. And as he was helping the women board onto lifeboats, he gave a message to one of the, one of the survivors and he said, Tell my wife, if it should happen, that my secretary and I both go down. Tell her I played the game out straight to the end. No woman shall be let aboard this ship because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. <clears throat> the last time that Ben Guggenheim was seen, he had dressed into his finest clothes and sat down with his servants on the ship's staircase awaiting the inevitable. But an interesting fact about this man is that as he was helping these women onto lifeboats and to uh, sending them into safety, he said, we're, he said to, his, to his secretary, we've dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. 
he and his secretary and his mistress both died when the Titanic went down. It is sad, my brethren, that that day over a thousand people Unbeknownst to them what the fate of that Titanic ship was going to be, that they went down with this great and massive structure. One of my greatest fears has always been to drown. I don't know <clears throat> if you've ever thought what the worst way would be to die. But to me, the two worst ways to die would, to, would be to be burned alive and to drown. Just a suffocating way, an impossible way to survive or to even cling on to something. No hope, such desperation, no way to get out. You're gasping for air, but there's no air because what you take in is water as it fills your lungs. These people could not get out in time. If I'm not mistaken, about 40 or more people only survived the Titanic going down. If one had foreknowledge that the ship would sink, how many people do you think would have remained on board? <clears throat> I remember a time when I was about to fly out of the country. I was waiting for a plane that had just flown in from New York City. It was delayed a little bit. And I was wondering why it had been delayed and I asked someone that worked for the airline, they said, well, we don't really know, sir. They did, but they didn't tell me. But I have an app on my phone that gives us information on delays and why it had been delayed. The reason that that plane had been delayed was because one of the engines, it was a huge Boeing airplane, one of the engines had failed. And they had fixed it, and they were sending it on the plane that I would transfer onto to fly for nine hours nonstop over the ocean. I had a first class ticket. I immediately went to the counter and I said, I'd like to change to a different flight. Because I felt I had foreknowledge of a plane that had a defective engine. And I did not want to fly in that plane. Would you have? And they gave me some grief and said I would have to wait till the next day to fly on a different flight. And I was about to say yes until I found out that the next day I would be on the same plane. <laughs> Since I had a first class ticket, I asked for a refund and booked on a different airline. I wasn't going to get on that plane. No way, no how. There are things that we need to get out before it's too late, my friends, my brethren. We need to keep in mind that Jesus is coming again. And since we know that Jesus is coming again, there are some things that we need to keep in mind. If you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 10. We need to keep in mind that every single one of us is going to be judged. Not just some of us. Not just the bad people whom we deem to be bad. But every one of us. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'll make a pause there to interject this. 
You might want to write in the margin of your Bible your name and the phrase personal appearance. Because when he says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, it means that you, that me, Ed Rangel, must make a personal appearance before the judgment seat of Christ. That means that if I die before the Lord Jesus comes, that when he does come, that I shall be resurrected and that I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And we usually think that the word recompense means receive a reward for something good and not for something bad. But the Holy Spirit says, or uses the word recompense to receive a payment to receive a reward, if you will, whether it be for what we've done good or for what we have done bad. So in the day of judgment that it is coming, whether it be in our lifetime or in a future time, whenever it may be, we will have to answer to him face to face, standing before the judgment seat of God or of Christ here in this verse. So the admonition is, since the end is coming and it will come, we need to make sure that we get out of whatever sin that we may be in. That we need to get out of whatever lifestyle that is contrary to God's lifestyle that he wants for us. We need to get out of that because a ship will sink. In this case, the world will be destroyed. In this case, the world will be burned up, will be destroyed. And we'll have to live somewhere else. And that somewhere else, we determine where we'll be by the way that we have lived, whether in heaven or an internal hellfire. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, and those witnesses that he refers to are found in Hebrews 11, all those great men and women from the Old Testament that lived by faith and acted by faith and did so, so many great things in honor of God, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. And the word encumbrance means everything that gets in our way and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the point is that those who have not gotten out of sin are lost. And those that have not gotten out of sin when the end comes, when Jesus comes, will be eternally lost. And as you could so vividly see in that video, People that were drowning were, were reaching out for whatever help they could get. And that ought to remind us the days of Noah when the floods came and the doors were shut or the door was shut to the ark. That after God seals it up, there is no more hope. So when the end comes and the world is destroyed, there is no more hope. The hope is now, today, while there is life. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 5.
He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear. So those that are faithful, those that do get out of sin, those who have the forethought because of the foreknowledge of what's coming, and get out of sin, and live and walk with Christ and in Christ, will be saved, will be redeemed and not suffer the effects of eternal damnation. Now, what kind of sins may we, may we need to get out of? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Apostle Paul is making reference <coughs> to some Christians who had hitched their wagons <coughs> To other Christians who were teaching a terrible false doctrine. And that false doctrine that they were teaching. Was that there was no resurrection of the dead. And Paul says if you don't believe that there is a resurrection of the dead. Then we are considered to be the most miserable Christians. The most miserable people alive. How can you not believe in a resurrection of the dead? Christ resurrected from the dead to give us hope that there is a resurrection. And you Christians have become friends with those fools who do not believe in a resurrection and thus have destroyed your faith and you've gone off the deep end and you have no hope now. So in verse 33 he says you need to be careful. Don't think that you're smarter than God. Don't think that you're wiser than your father. Bad company, bad friendships corrupt good morals. So when we apply that to our secular life, to our friends, a lot of teenagers tell their parents, Mom, you're wrong about my friends. Yeah, they drink beer. Yeah, they go out and smoke pot. And they might do a few lines of coke or whatever drugs they might do, be doing. They cuss and they, and they steal and they, they, they do some terrible things. But mom, I'm not like them. And I won't be like them. I'm good. And I can influence them to be good like me. Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. And Paul, inspired by God, says, don't be an idiot. Don't be stupid. Those bad friends will corrupt you. And that's the type of sin that we need to get out of before Jesus comes. You see? And I am telling you, that I've seen many young Christian people walk around like they're the smartest thing that ever lived and thinking that, that their, 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 their bad moral friends will not affect their morality. And before you know it, they're acting like them Subtly. They're talking like them subtly. And they're thinking like them. Subtly. Until they're all like them. And faking their Christianity. If you're considering. Becoming a Christian. There has to be radical change. You have to get out, not have one foot in and one foot out. Because those on the Titanic, if you could pull them out and resurrect them and ask them, they'll tell you, buddy, I wanted to get out completely, not partially. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we need to get out of ourselves as well. Notice Ephesians 2 and verse 10. For, for we are the workmanship of God created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. 
Many times we want to do what we want to do for our pleasure, for our desires, for our, for, for, for our fun. And we forget that we are the workmanship. We belong to God for His pleasure. For His good works. And we need to empty ourselves of ourselves. And fill ourselves with God. Think like God. Live for God. And do for God. But I must move on. Matthew chapter 5 is a chapter about the Sermon on the Mount. So I have as a sub point about some sins that we may need to get rid of. And I listed the church building. Now who would have ever thought that a preacher would say that the building, the church building is a sin. When we come to church and believe that this is the religion that God requires of us only, then it is a sin. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Did you get that last part? The salt of the earth and the light of the world. And the salt is good for many things, but you know what happens when you consume salt? It makes you thirsty, right? We should live in such a way in the world, conduct ourselves in such a way in the world that it makes people thirsty of wanting more. And you can't accomplish that by just coming to church and being a Christian in church. You got to live that way outside of church as well. And if we practice our religion in church alone, then that's a sin. You got to be the light and the salt outside of church as well. And you got to get out of your Christian cliques and get out into the world to spread the gospel to the world. Now you might say, well, Brother Ed, I just, I just don't feel comfortable. I, don't, I can't remember Scripture. That's okay. Get out and be a Christian among the world. You don't have to remember much other than behave yourself. And don't get involved in gossip and backbiting and all kinds of stuff that you know you ought not do. And that's being the salt of the earth the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 13, if you're in false religion, oh boy, if you're involved in false religion, Matthew 15, verse 13 says, that every plant that my father has not planted, he shall uproot. In false religion, if it's not found in the scriptures, then it's false religion. In one of my recent talks and recent Bible studies with a friend of mine, well, we became friends. I think he might not like me anymore. But a Jehovah's Witness. I asked him, where, where do you go to get this name calling yourself a Jehovah's Witness? He said, well, many, many years ago, we were called the International Bible Students. So where did you get that name from? He said, well, we found it wasn't in the Bible, so we changed it to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it took me to some passage in the Old Testament, I said, well, did you realize that, 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 that the, the, the prophet was speaking to the Jews? And you, my friend, are not a Jew. He said, well, what, what do you call yourself? I said, well, I don't call myself anything. The Holy Spirit called me a Christian. You know, they're in Acts, where they're called Christians for the first time. He said, well, yeah, yeah, we're, we're called Jehovah's, Christian Jehovah Witnesses. I said, it doesn't say that in the Bible, my friend. Find me a passage in the Bible that says Christian Jehovah Witnesses or Jehovah Witnesses Christians. He said, no, but it's understood. I said, it's not understood by me. There's no such thing in the Bible as Baptist Christians or Methodist Christians. It's not in there. It's just Christian. So we have to call things, Bible things, by Bible names. And this is why Jesus says, Every plant that my Father has not planted shall be uprooted. And if, if my Father did not plant it, everything else is a false religion. 
And it's high time we start speaking the truth in love, with kindness, with graciousness and compassion, but not shrinking from the truth. Now, I need to end my lesson. I'm glad to know that as I look out here, most of you got out of, got out of the ship already and confessed your faith that Christ is the Son of God and repented and decided that you were going to live a life different and distinct of what you lived before. Put on Christ through baptism. And when you came out of the watery grave, you said to God through your actions, Here I am, do with me whatever you desire. Yet, I know that there are some within uh, this group today that have not done that. And that is good. Because today you have that opportunity to get out of that ship. If you read James chapter 4, verses 14 through 17 with me, the Apostle James says something very, very poignant. And obviously very true. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Yet... You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. We're going to read verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Before I read that all the way through, I want you to highlight, if you will, the word yet in verse 14, the word instead in verse 15, and the word therefore in verse 17. Those are the three transitional words that could save your life forever. Yet, instead, and therefore. And by the way, though, there is a sermon outline for you men. Yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But it is, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is evil. And what the Apostle James is teaching is this. We might say, today I shall not accept Jesus. Today I might not obey the gospel. Because I could do that tomorrow or next week, or next month. Well, I could do that next year or whenever, but today, not, not today. And James says, instead of saying that, you ought to say, if perchance I live tomorrow. Now, why would he say, if perchance if I live tomorrow? Because those on the Titanic thought they were going to enjoy a beautiful, beautiful, trip, beautiful cruise, and they did not enjoy it. Instead of saying that, you boast in your arrogance, thinking that you own tomorrow. Therefore, if you know that obeying the gospel today is a good thing to do, obey it right now as together we stand and sing.